All right, well, we're going to get started. Uh, on the last day. All right, and I'm seeing we're enjoy, uh, joined by two esteemed guests here sitting in the, in the front row. So, All right, so we finished yesterday talking about Rayleigh scattering, and the last slide that we left were, were some of the potential cons or complications of Rayleigh scattering. And one of the more, most difficult is applying Rayleigh scattering in the presence of interfering media, whether it be walls, particles, surfaces, windows, I can even pose a significant problem. So what we're going to talk to, to about today uh, for this lecture are, again, just briefly review some limitations and talk about an approach called uh, filtered Rayleigh scattering, which uh, effectively can block out a, a, it, some portion to all of your interference, depending on uh, the experiment you're uh, considering. And then I'll show some applications of uh, FRS and, and reacting flows. Okay, so again, many of you are familiar with particle scattering. So we know that if we put particles, whether they're dust or smoke or anything else, uh, in the flow, they effectively scatter. And we saw this uh, when we were looking at scattering particles for tracers, that the cross section, if you will, were many orders of magnitude larger than, you know, at uh, for, say, a, a micron-sized particle compared to something that would have been considered a molecule. And so we, we know that if you send a laser through, really all you're going to see is the scattering from, let's say, particle scattering or me scattering. It's on the order of 1,000 times higher than that of Rayleigh scattering. Okay? Rayleigh scattering, again, occurs. We haven't talked anything about the spectroscopy of Rayleigh scattering other than the fact that we say, okay, it occurs at the same wavelength as the incident laser, okay? And so the scattered light it comes back at essentially the same uh, wavelength. So again, if it does that, if you have that same scattering for particles, surfaces, et cetera, you, can, you can't uh, optically filter out the two with conventional means, okay? So again, here was uh, our scattering chart that we had looked at. Uh, again, let's say we have PIV dust particles, anything like that. They're in this size range, and then if we're looking, say, at molecules, they, they get down in this range, and you can see a significant uh, type of uh, differential scattering. So again, if we look at the cross-section, uh, they're not even comparable. Okay. So again, one of the biggest challenges when you apply Rayleigh scattering than we do in my lab, we do a lot of Rayleigh scattering, filter Rayleigh scattering, is that you're actually trying to make the flow as quote unquote dust free, particle free as possible. Your lines go through significant filtrations and because particles are always the enemy, you just can't do anything. If you have a few, that's fine. You just don't consider the data there and you're, you're fine. But if you have a head, heavily laden flow, the, the data is kind of useless. Okay? So you can already start to think that PIV is not going to be possible uh, with Rayleigh scattering. So here's kind of an example uh, this is uh, uh, Rayleigh scattering in a premixed flame in the presence uh, of soot, okay, or dust. There, there's a few different images. What we can see here is this is really what your images are going to, going to look like. You can see in the kind of dust-free region, I, I think this is dust, not soot, actually, uh, and you can see uh, where it's hot, those things get incinerated, they're burned, so they're not there. But anywhere else, you get this extremely uh, overwhelming uh, signal from the particle. Okay? So you, you just can't discern any information there. You probably already guessed that from that, because when you look at a PIV image where you put particles in, all you see are particles. Right? You don't see the gas phase behind there. Okay? So really, we can just see this uh, giant difference between the particle phase and the uh, gas phase. It's also, Rayleigh scattering is also quite limited in the neighborhood surfaces. This is a nice, uh, nice work where what happens is they had uh, a simple laminar flame going, okay, with wall windows very far away, and these aren't even solid walls. And what you see is what you would expect for Rayleigh scattering in a, a simple laminar premix flame. High signal in the middle, that are your reactants, products, very low signal, and going back to the ambient air, okay. 
And so really what happens is they start off with these two windows really far away such that the scattering off the windows is not affecting the measurement. And then the windows were moved closer and closer and closer until here is where you're starting to see influence. Okay, and you're starting to get increased signal because you're getting scattering coming back from the window, back scattering off the window, and it's giving you extra signal. Now the problem about that is that if you remember Rayleigh scattering, it's inversely proportional to signal. So if you're picking up extra signal, you're going to falsely bias your temperature toward a higher value. Okay, so if you have something like 2,000 degrees, you're going to easily start measuring uh, 1,000 degrees or less, something like that. Okay, and so that's kind of a nice, uh, nice example. And then really, you can see here as they get closer and closer, the signal just becomes extremely high. It even starts to overwhelm the actual gas phase. So you would get just completely erroneous measurements. Uh, they wouldn't even make any sense, okay? And this is, again, the few times just attempted regular Rayleigh scattering. The idea is keep the windows really far away, make sure they're AR coded, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're talking about a technical combustor, or even looking at flow, anything close to a surface, even if it is a transparent surface, the scattering off the surface can overwhelm the signal. Okay. So in preparation for filter Rayleigh scattering as a, uh, as a measure to kind of combat this problem, let's look a little bit at the spectroscopy of Rayleigh scattering. Okay? So far, again, we've simply referred to this emitted signal coming back as, quote unquote, having the same frequency. You send a green laser in, 532, you get 532 light out, okay? Well, we know there's no such thing as pure monochromatic light, so you probably expect that the mid uh, Rayleigh scattering is at least as wide as the laser, okay? So that's our first step. We say, okay, there's, if we have a laser has a certain spectral distribution, we most likely would have at least the same thing as the laser. So this turns out to be the case if you have a very broadband source, and we'll connect this in just a second. If you have a very broadband source and you somehow measured the bandwidth of the scattered light, you would see this. But what the better question is, what if you had a very narrow source? What if you had an infinitely thin uh, laser uh, so that you could actually resolve the actual spectra of the scattered intensity? And this is what we want to talk about. Okay? Okay, so now what we're going to do is uh, take a step back and refine our terminology. What we did in last lecture, we talked about scattering processes. The lecture was spontaneous scattering. We said there's Rayleigh and there's Raman, okay, and I mentioned a few other. But now let's take a, take a step back. And let's say we send a laser into a neutral gas. So we have no uh, free electrons. We, have no, we don't have plasma or anything like that. So we just send it in. We will collect three, and we could call it actually four distinct sources, okay? We talked about, we'll talk about in the next lecture, Raman scattering. So we actually collect vibrational Raman, okay? We collect pure rotational Raman scattering, and we'll talk about this is where the rotation of the molecule modulates the light. And we collect something called the Caban's line, okay? And this line uh, actually contains three components itself. So what you do is you have a central uh, gross landau plasic line, okay, this is going to be basically due to the thermal motion of the molecules. We have the brilliant uh, Mandelstam, or we'll call it brilliant scattering, so we have doublets here that are based from acoustic process. And actually you have another Q uh, branch rotational Raman line that sits here on the middle, okay. So we have, again, we can start to see there's getting some rich spectroscopy just in what we referred to as Rayleigh scattering, and I'll come back to this in a little bit, but when we make a Rayleigh scattering measurement in general, we collect all of this, okay? We collect even the rotational Raman, okay? We don't usually, the spacing is so small, even if you apply just a normal kind of bandpass green filter that's, let's say, even five nanometers, well, you end up collecting all the rotational Raman. And again, I'll show here that your scattering cross-section that we derived last time for Rayleigh scattering actually contains all the rotational Raman effects in there as well, okay? So you have rotational Raman, you have Brillian uh, scattering, and you have the central growth line, okay? So to attack this, uh, because the spectroscopy becomes very important for filter Rayleigh scattering, uh, let's take a look at the case of low bulk density. Let's say in the limit we have zero pressure or very low pressure or extremely high temperature. Okay, 
you'll remember that all our molecules have random motion. They're described by Gaussian statistics, Max, sorry, Maxwellian distribution. Therefore, all the molecules are randomly moving. Therefore, their movement has to lead to every time they move an instantaneous Doppler shift, and you end up having an averaged effect that gives you a Gaussian distribution around the mean flow velocity of the flow. Now, I say the mean velocity of the flow is because you, you can also, depend on your detection scheme, you can also have a, uh, you can have a Doppler shift of the bulk flow. Like if you have a principal flow velocity as well, your actual scattered light will also shift in space as well due to the bulk uh, Doppler, the actual uh, Doppler shift of the, the bulk velocity. Uh, we typically describe everything uh, as the spectra centered on the laser line, but with strong, let's say, high-speed flows are a great example, you end up shifting this so that your shift where you're Rayleigh scattering your Caban's line is, sh is centered around a displaced center that's due to the bolt velocity. Uh, sorry, the Doppler shift due to the bolt velocity. So again, let's keep that in mind as we work through the spectra. So this part is very similar to what we saw in uh, looking at fluorescence. It's just laser-induced fluorescence. We have an observation angle uh, that plays a role because depending on how the user is oriented to the scattering process, uh, you get an effective uh, greater width or, or narrower width just due to the Doppler effect itself. Okay. So let's take a look at these things. Let's say we have P approaching zero, so we have no collisions in the limit of no collision whatsoever. Uh, the scattering profile at this point only reflects the motion of the molecules and the thermal motion of the molecules. So I've shown here a uh, green uh, laser. This is kind of, we'll put it wave numbers. This is common for an injection seated ND YAG laser. It's about 0 .003 wave numbers or something like that. And then these are what now the profiles will look like the black is for T equals 300, red's for 1,000, blue's for 2,000. And as you know, it's increasing with the temperature the width uh, of the Doppler width. Okay? So again, if we have no collisions, okay, this is what your scattered light would look like. Okay? The uh, Rayleigh, sc Rayleigh brilliant scattering, there would actually be no brilliant effects. Uh, this would be in the limit of no collisions. So this is what's referred to as the Knudsen regime in gas kinetics, where you have limit of zero collisions or very few collisions. Okay. Now let's consider what's going to happen as we go into a real environment. We have pressure. Okay. We need to actually discuss what's happening in the probe volume. Okay. And let's see if we can uh, we'll walk through this. Let's say we, uh, let's say scattering, uh, we send an electric field and the scattering process occurs. Okay, and we're observing it at an angle, uh, here we go, theta. Okay, and let's just say the scattering's from the thermal density fluctuation, so it's from the Doppler portion. Okay, then what happens is the emitted scattering or the, the scattering in the instant laser light will form an interference pattern. So you have the electric field, you have the light that's coming out, they'll form an interference pattern that has a grading frequency and it has to satisfy Bragg's condition. Okay, so we have the, the wavelength of the laser, okay, and we have now uh, the wavelength of the scattering. Okay? Now, we'll, we set up sort of this Bragg uh, cell or this grating, essentially a, a grating. I don't call it a thermal grating, it's just a grating. Uh, and at the same time, what's happening, all your microscopic, we've talked about this, the density fluctuations. Remember, all our molecules are moving, so they remember they're moving, they're being perturbed. We, we set up these small density fluctuations. We talked about this last time. They, their movement have to create acoustic perturbations. Anything creates a small acoustic perturbation. Now these perturbations are then now going to travel in the medium and prop propagate. Okay. Now these acoustic disturbances also create additional microscale density fluctuations because pressure, these, pre these acoustic, that's just uh, the, uh, the other side of density, right? This is now uh, uh, constant entropy, but we have these, these density fluctuations. But these are being transported at the speed of sound, okay? Now, as the number of density increases, the mean free path decreases. We know that. We get 
We get uh, closer and closer for our collisions. And when the mean free path is less than this expression here, the Bragg con uh, Bragg's condition is satisfied. And the density fluctuations actually start to contribute to the scattering. So now these acoustic uh, fluctuations, these disturbances actually scatter off of the Bragg cell, if you will, off the grating, and they start to uh, give off light. Okay? So we've created a grating between our, our scattering and our laser, and then now the acoustic perturbations that, are, that have been generated by mo molecular movement are actually scattered off of this grating. Now, the density fluctuations we talk about, this, these are due to the acoustic perturbations, uh, are moving at the speed of sound. And so again, they undergo a Doppler shift, okay? And the scattering is observed at these frequency shifts, okay? We have, we have the initial frequency of the incident light, and here A is the speed of sound, and C is the speed of light, okay? And that's our observation angle. So what we get, these are the Brillian uh, Mandelsham doublets, or sometimes just referred to as Brillian scattering, okay? And so what they look like are these solid light lines, okay? And then there's also a central peak, this is the gross line, okay, that's due to non-propagating density fluctuations, okay? So it doesn't have a Doppler shift, its Doppler shift is zero, okay? So we end, if you look at these, uh, I have in the background the dashed lines are just due to the Doppler. They're not occurring during this process. I just wanted to show them in reference. But these are actually what just normalize profiles uh, of the uh, Brillion sidebands. They're called the sidebands would look like. Okay? Now, when the mean free path is much less than this wavelength lambda s, this is what's called the hydrodynamic regime. This is really lots of collisions is all this is. This is the hydrodynamic regime in gas kinetics. And your, your scattering, you would, they would dominate. There'd be no thermal processes, and your uh, scattering line shape would look like just a series of three Lorentzian line shapes. Okay? So just quick recap, in the two limits where we have no collisions, we would have a series of Gaussian profiles. In a series where we have do collisions dominate, Okay, we will have these three Laurentian peaks. And the distance here, this is just related to the speed of sound in the medium. This is the Doppler shift. So you, we just have uh, black is 300, red is 1,000, and blue is 2,000. So they're moving away with increasing temperature, as expected. Okay, if you do square root of gamma RT. So now what we have to think about is the majority of our regimes, it's somewhere in the middle. Okay, it's not... We don't have an infinite number of collisions, and we don't have any collisions, okay? We, we hope that we live in a world that has some sort of pressure, okay? So this is sort of what they start to look like. Let's take a look. We'll digest all of these, and I'll try to walk through all these. are just examples. I think somehow they're, e they're easier to look through uh, in terms of kind of case by case. Again, let's start with just room, what we call room temperature, which in terms of collisions is typically a fair, it could be a... a can be considered a high temperature, uh, depending on what process you're looking at. But let's say we have our laser line. Again, this is a pretty narrow line. It's typically Gaussian, and I think is what most people model their laser line at. Okay, let's say at 300 K, I have no pressure. Again, uh, completely uh, free space. Uh, we have a pure Gaussian. That's the black line. Okay. I haven't shown you how to calculate these or where these are coming from, but just want you to see the spectral line shapes right now. Now, as we start to increase the pressure a little bit, 0.1 atmospheres, you can see the red curve. It looks an awful lot about the Gaussian, but it's not quite. We can already see a, a slight influence. Now, let's work our way up. Atmosphere is a condition we know pretty well. That's the blue, not Gaussian at all. Okay? Uh, and then as we keep working our way up, for we end up like 10 atmospheres are being dominated by these brilliant sidebands, okay? Now, you can walk your way exactly through an example if you just pick a really high pressure to kind of look at extreme cases, right? And then you can start, even at, if we're at high pressure, even at room temperature, we already start with, uh, we start with these uh, um, three lobes, completely dominated by the Laurentian, and even going up to something that's insanely high, like three or 4,000, 
degrees Kelvin. Uh, these are still not Gaussian profiles. You can see the flatness here in these, two prof in these profiles. So again, we can just see from here that we're going to have, for most situations, we're going to have neither the hydrodynamic nor uh, the kinetic regime. So we're going to have a combination of thermal effects and collisional effects in the spectroscopy. Okay? So in order to compare the relative importance of the random thermal motion to what's called the correlated acoustic motion, a quantity called the Y parameters defined, it's just a ratio of the scattering uh, wavelength to the mean free path. Okay? And so it just set, sets this up. And you can ultimately write it in terms of number density, K mu, uh, viscosity, uh, mass, Boltzmann constant, and T. So again, the way that this works, if Y is much, much greater than 1, uh, you are in the hydrodynamic regime. Okay? Again, collisions dominate. If Y is less than 1, you're in the Knudsen uh, regime. Okay? I, sorry, a second I said the kinetic regime. The kinetic regime is in between. So we typically don't high in the hydrodynamic regime, which is collisions, and the Knudsen regime is the rarefied flow. No, it's the kinetic regime where, where most of the things rely, which is in the middle. Okay. Uh, so again, if these two sort of limit cases are satisfied, uh, then, you, uh, then, you can, then your line shapes are actually very simple to calculate. They're Gaussians. If you're in the Knudsen regime, the Laurentians, if you're in the hydrodynamic regime. Now, if th these uh, cases aren't satisfied, both processes are important, and the line shape must be modeled. And we have to talk about that to really work on uh, the diagnostic. This is a case, again, uh, this is air this time. Uh, I think this is air, yeah. And we have uh, y is equal to 0, which is our Gaussian. And again, y.75 is kind of STP, or, or very close to it. T equals 300K, P is one atmosphere, and you get y is equal to 0.75, which means sort of the acoustic effects, even at uh, uh, atmosphere, have to be taken into account. So what do some of these look like in combustion conditions? Let's look at this for a few different species. And remember, don't worry, uh, some of these slides are, are new, and you'll get them, all the new updated slides will be available. Uh, so let's take a look at what some of these look like. On the left are two examples. Don't worry about the dashed line for right now. Uh, you have just different species at 300 degrees Kelvin, and here you have 1,600 degrees Kelvin. And what I've done is I've gone and calculated all the different Y parameters for these species as a function of temperature. And what you can see is at room temperature, this is at one atmosphere, you can see everything lies near one, uh, where you have to consider both effects. But even as you elevate temperature at one atmosphere, 12, 15, okay, you still have something that cannot be described by a pure Gaussian. Okay? Now, as you increase uh, pressure, all these do is shift up, okay? such that then everything essentially lies in the kinetic regime. Okay, and there again, we have to combine the effects of thermal and acoustic motion. Okay. Now, that's a little bit on the spectroscopy of what you get when you actually send uh, laser light through. We, we need to kind of give you a general idea. Now, if we want to try to use this information in a diagnostic, we need to start thinking, thinking a little bit about the spectroscopy, if you will, of particle or surface scattering. Okay? Uh, you have uh, solid or li liquid particles. When you scatter the light, they don't give you back anything at a delta function. And you actually don't get exactly the laser. It's almost. You actually do get uh, a Doppler broadened profile. But remember, the Doppler broadening is due to thermal motion of the molecules. And as you get liquids, they're very, the molecules are very close together. So there can't be a whole lot of motion. And solids are the extreme case to where relative uh, the constituent atoms in a solid, they can't move uh, past each other. So you do, all you do is end up getting an increase due to vibration. The vibration of some sort of solid will actually increase and give you a slight uh, Doppler broadening. But these Doppler broadening line widths are actually less than even the laser line width. So when you convolve the Doppler broadening with the laser, what you see coming out looks exactly like the laser. 
Okay, so they just have very little thermal motion, and that's why we can say it's almost exactly the same. Well, that, that's something we're going to take uh, advantage of because this means that there's significant spectral differences between the light scattering properties from solid liquids, which are, are or surfaces, right? These are our interfering uh, parameters and gases. So gases versus solid slash liquids. Okay, and this is how, the idea behind uh, filtered Rayleigh scattering. For those who aren't familiar with this, let's assume we have a very narrow spectral line with laser, such that the laser line width is much much less. Uh, than the Rayleigh Brillion line. So the Rayleigh Brillion line is uh, something that's given sort of that width of that Cabanas line. So again, there's a lot of nomenclature if you're in the literature that's, uh, that's a little confusing. The process is in general uh, re referred to, so Rayleigh scattering, I don't, I don't know that I go and clear this up later. So Rayleigh scattering, when we do Rayleigh scattering, just regular old Rayleigh scattering, we're kind of talking about the collective process between uh, the Cabanas line uh, rotational Raman, the Kubrich Raman, Brillion, we get, we get all of that stuff coming in, okay? Rayleigh Brillion scattering refers to just typically uh, the Caban's line in absence of the rotational Raman, okay? We just, we don't consider that. But it does have the Kubrant's rotational Raman on top of it, the one on the center that we just, we can't separate out, okay? And I'll, I'll talk about that in, when we do the rotational Raman section next lecture. So whenever I say RBS, we're generally referring to this line shape here. Okay. So let's assume we have, in this case, we have a laser that's much narrower than the gas phase scattering line shape. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put a, a, what's called atomic or molecular filter in front of our camera. So it's all it is is an optical cell that's filled with a species that absorbs a certain wavelength. So when you're dealing with the second harmonic, 532 of a YAG, a uh, cell full of iodine works great. Iodine has uh, absorption spectra that overlap uh, at 532. So what we need is that the absorption transition of iodine okay, is somewhere in between. We need it to be less than that of the Rayleigh Brillion, but much greater than the laser line. So you end up with this. So here again, this orange is our, what we'll call our RBS profile. That's the Kavans line. And then we have our, this dashed line is actually just a portion of the iodine spe absorption spectra, okay? And this is our laser line. So what we can think about is that when we send a laser through and we get the scattering that's coming out, we'll say it's on top of each other, right? We have the gas phase scattering, and then we have the particle surface, all that scattering is just on top of each other. But the way that looks spectrally is the blue is the, any scattering from particle surfaces droplets, right? The, it's coming back with a broad frequency that looks just like the laser line, right? But now our Rayleigh Brillion, the gas phase scattering looks like this spectrally, okay? Not spatially, but spectrally. So then when it interacts, the light comes through, when it interacts with the iodine, all of the stuff that has this spectral component, i.e. the particle scattering, the surface, is absorbed. Okay? And this portion that's marked in green is the fraction of the gas phase, the RBS light, passes on through the detector. Okay? So the idea is that you can discriminately collect a portion of the gas phase signal while blocking particulate signal surface scattered. So filter Rayleigh scattering was actually developed here at Princeton by Dick Miles, and so it was in the late 90s, and so it kind of has a rich, rich uh, hit, uh, literature. I'll talk about late, later why there's some aspects where it uh, just uh, had a lot of complications and uh, you know, maybe where it had some difficulties in some areas that my group has worked on. Uh, we've been able to kind of fix some of these issues. So uh, we're now getting, I'll show you some examples, getting some really good measurements with it with FRS. Yeah. So again, hopefully the concept uh, makes, makes a lot of sense. So it, uh, it's a wonderful, what I call PowerPoint uh, diagnostic. You can show exactly how it's supposed to work. You can use words like all the scatterings blocked, all the particle scatterings blocked. We collect and we get gas phase information. Now it, it doesn't work that way and that's what we'll spend some time talking about 
Okay. So again, all we need to know is we block the particles and we collect a portion of the gas phase signal. Okay, now we have to look a little bit at the equation uh, for a filter Rayleigh scattering. I think now, given that graphical picture from before, we can, uh, hopefully we can connect some of these, these equations. So the equation for filter Rayleigh is a, is a modification. So we're not going to go through it um, and derive a, uh, anything because we're, we're, we're essentially using what we already got for a Rayleigh scatter. So if you remember Rayleigh scattering, the, the signal from Rayleigh would have just been C times the instant intensity times the number density, and there would have been a differential scattering cross-section there, right? So we write this in the exact same way, except we have to replace our differential scattering cross-section with something we call the FRS variable, which is the differential scattering cross-section times the actual integral over spectral space of the line shape times the transmission. So if you remember back on the previous page, we have this interaction between the actual light that's given out and the iodine cell, so we're only collecting a portion of the light, okay? So we have to account for the fraction of the light. Let's think about this from Rayleigh scattering point of view. This integral becomes what? One, right? We don't have, our transmission is just one everywhere, so we integrate through. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a filter, so this goes to one, and we recover the Rayleigh scattering uh, equation. Okay? So keep in mind, this is the transmission of the filter species, so this is the transmission of iodine, and this is actually that RBS, which is, again, since it's I, it's species-specific. Okay? Now, that's, again, we must point out, FRS is highly dependent on the overlap between the filter species and the RBS spectrum, okay? The RBS spectrum is temperature dependent. If nothing else, you know that Doppler broadening component is temperature dependent, but it turns out that the acoustic part is temperature dependent. So the RBS profile uh, turns out to be quite temperature dependent, but the iodine profile is not, right? It's just sitting in your lab, right? It's at some temperature, it's static. So as temperature increases, the RBS spectra will get wider and wider, and more and more light will come through your cell. Okay, so you have to uh, know a lot about the spectroscopy. Okay, and that's it. Quanti uh, quantitative interpretation requires knowledge of the line shape. So just to give you kind of an animation, again, kind of orient you between the two, what, what we have here is an LRS, a traditional Rayleigh scattering experiment. And again, I think a few of you have done Rayleigh scattering, right? Anybody do Ray Rayleigh scattering or a plan to do Rayleigh scattering? Okay. Well, good technique if you are going to do it. You, this is kind of the idea is that you have the laser spectrum and the light detected, but as we talked about, do you really care what the spectroscopy is doing? No, you either are not optically filtering or if you're just trying to get out the, the other uh, light in your room and you're collecting green, just the best kind of bandpass filter you can find may be let's say a couple of nanometers, and that's 10, 20 wave numbers. Uh, so <laughs> way over here. So no matter what the spectra is doing, you're just collecting it all, right? And so that's where you get, this is for air, this is the uh, 1 over T dependence, right? Now, for FRS, again, our I2 spectra doesn't change, but as a function of temperature, our Rayleigh Brillion uh, source is changing, okay? It's going from something that's not Gaussian to this approaching a Gaussian. So you're collecting more and more signal relatively. Now this is not meant to imply that you get the same amount of signal from LRS and FRS. As you can imagine, I'm already cutting off some of the signal, so this really should have been down here starting at 0.2 for the FRS. It's just, it's easier to draw at one. This is a relative signal compared to 300K. So since you're the amount that's coming through the cell is increasing with temperature, your relative signal compared to 300K for FRS is more, although your absolute compared to LRS is much less by about a factor of four, okay? Because you you're cutting off light. You're already, you're chopping off this portion in the middle with the filter. But you can see through these expressions that LRS has the one over T dependence, but FRS has not only the same one over T dependence from number density, Right, that's the number density dependence, but it also has a temperature dependence in the RBS spectra and, and its relationship with the cell. cell. So it's both species and temperature dependent. 
So not only is the cross section a function of temperature, but the RBS profile and its temperature dependence is a function of species. So for a mixture, uh, the FRS equation can be written in a, in a similar manner. Uh, or actually, let me, it should be written in this manner, then we'll actually write it. What you really should have uh, in that case is you should be able to write the equation at looking a lot like Rayleigh scattering. Here's the optical effects, efficiency, and C. We have I intensity. Here's our number density. Here's our Rayleigh scattering mixture, our mole fraction weighted scattering. And then we should have a single profile that describes the RBS spectra of the mixture. Now, now bear with me. That's, I haven't said anything yet about making that a mole fraction weighted average. We should just have whatever the soup is, there should be some uh, rayleigh brillion scattering uh, spectral line shape that describes that, and it would be a function of pressure, temperature, velocity here, observation angle, and frequency. Okay? Now, we have to think about this. If we wanted to describe this in the kinetic regime, and let's just say we're modeling it for gas mixtures, uh, this would be very, very complex because there's a need for kind of transport coefficients, heat conductivity, uh, viscosity, bulk viscosity, all these things that go between the different gases. You'd have to have a multi-component kind of description and describing interspecies transport, and these just aren't known uh, for the gases, okay? So it's impossible to kind of describe properly just the scattering, treating the mixture as a gas, if that makes sense. Just as a, not a single component, but whatever the gas is, getting the scattering out. So instead we do this. Uh, maybe this will make a bit more sense. Instead of actually knowing what the Rayleigh Brillion spectra is for the mixture, because we don't, we actually express the measured signal as, again, a mole fraction weighted uh, average of the, again, the scattering cross section, and then we treat each, we sum up all of the Rayleigh Brillion uh, line shapes separately, okay, and add them up. Okay? So that is different. I hope you can appreciate that is a different phenomenon because uh, we're assuming at this point when you sum them up, all their individual contributions, individually you assume that there's no interaction between each other, right? If I have a volume and I put some carbon dioxide, some water, and CO, and I know they're all one-third, 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 and I say the signal is one-third one of that as if it were, I treat that by itself, and I treat that by itself, and I treat that by itself, and just give them equal parts weighting, I've said the scattering properties, the optical properties have not interacted with each other at all. And that's not true. That's not what actually happens. So the different species have interactions, we just don't know how to describe those interactions. So what, what we do is make this assumption that we can treat them. And let me, let me step back, that in the limit of no collisions, molecules are really far apart, right? This would be right, because this would scatter, this one would scatter, and their scattering processes would not interact with each other, okay? But as we get more and more molecules where they get closer and closer, this becomes inaccurate. So in the kinetic regime, we've, we've done a series of measurements, and we show that this appears to be an appropriate measurement. But I do not think it will be accurate as you go up in pressure into the hydrodynamic regime, okay? I think as you have more and more collisions, it becomes less accurate, but I just don't know. Uh, but within the kinetic regime, which is kind of where we tend to lie at, say, atmospheric pressure and, and, and combustion temperatures, this works. Uh, we've looked at this with a series of binary and, and mixing type problems, and this seems to work, work very well. Okay. okay, now how are we going to get temperature out of this? Similar to LRS, uh, we're going to normalize these measurements by a reference condition. So if you take that equation, all I've done is in inserted in the ideal gas law and did the exact same thing that we did for Rayleigh scattering. So we're going to make a filter Rayleigh scattering measurement at some reference condition. Let's say it's pure air, okay, that's fine. Then that would be the differential scattering cross-section of air. This would be the Rayleigh Brillion scattering of air, and again, at standard temperature and pressure. This would be the signal we measured there, and we would know our reference temperature because most likely we would do it at room temperature, you know, so it's 296K or something like that. That's our ref. Then this, sorry, 
This would be what we measured at any point. You can make this temperature species space dependent. And then we would measure out our temperature. So what you see here is it's the same as Rayleigh scattering. It's inversely proportional to the intensity that you measure, your scattering signal. Then we have the, now the added complication of how does this Rayleigh brillion uh, signal and its interaction with the transmission spectra change as a function of, as we move through a mixture of gases that are changing in temperature. Okay, so that's kind of the, the complication. All right, but if we can look at that, we can get uh, temperature from measured uh, signals. But again, the RBS spectral profiles for the species must be known, and the spectral fil filter characteristics must be known. Okay? And again, let's take a look. Now that we know that this signal is heavily temperature and species dependent, we can now then say, okay, well, it also looks like every species has its own uh, scattering line shape, and this makes sense because even just for the Doppler component, it's going to go as this one over the square root of the molecular weight. So the light species are going to get very broad, okay? And then depending on all the other parameters that uh, determine the brillion components, which we won't talk about, uh, they're, they're just, it's a lot of transport properties. They're also different. Uh, their heat conductivity, viscosity, bulk uh, viscosity. Uh, all these things, they're, temper they're species dependent. You have to know all of those to describe the, the different line shapes. So let's talk about from an experimental point of view, what do we have to consider? We have to consider laser filter cell combination. We have to consider uh, the RBS and the filter species models. Okay, well, we, we have to be able to describe that spectral line shape somehow. And we need to be able to reduce the data and take our signal and turn it into, let's say, if the quantity of interest is temperature. Because we have to be able to account for the fact that if we're in a combustion system, we have a whole bunch of species, their concentration is varying, and we don't know them. Okay? So the first one, it's not easy to achieve, a, it's not difficult to achieve a narrow spectral bandwidth at a number of frequencies. So that's, uh, that's, that's decent that you can do that with a CW laser. The slight challenge there is having a high energy pulse laser that has narrow spectral output, and it also needs to overlap uh, with an uh, atomic or molecular species that has excellent absorption characteristics, okay? So you, do, you don't want anything that's like a broadband absorber like a dye. You want something that has d these discrete, remember the absorption transition needs to be less than the rayleigh brillion transition for this technique to work. Okay, so in Miles uh, 2001, there's many possible candidates. Uh, and, uh, and the LIDAR community, if any of you dabble in atmospheric sensing or things like that, you'll see there's a number uh, of these uh, type of vapor cells, and I could go through all of these, but you can see that really you're looking at where a lot of these different species overlap with different outputs, okay? And any of the, anything you can tune, you can most likely get to with a dye laser, but a dye laser output is not typically not narrow or enough unless the unless you have really broad uh, output. The two for FRS that have received the most attention are iodine at 532 and mercury vapor at 254. So again, that's the second harmonic of a YAG, and 254 is, uh, it can be done a few different ways, but third harmonic of a Thai sapphire or alexandrite laser, okay? So, going, just going back real quick, these are, these are the spectra down here, not, not great uh, reproduction here, but this is the iodine spectra over just a, a wave number or so. And this is what sort of the mercury spectra, uh, again, hyperfine, uh, has some hyperfine splitting, but looks like uh, uh, mercury spectra as well, okay? So again, I like to keep coming back to this so you can ap appreciate the difference for traditional LRS the complete spectrally dispersed Kavanaugh's line is collected. No model is needed, right? Rayleigh scan, we don't need to know uh, the spectral characteristics, but we do need to know them for FRS, okay? So for iodine, uh, there's very good models, uh, or really only one, but it's very good. This was developed here at Princeton by Joe Forkey and Dick Miles. Uh, it calculates the absorption spectra of the BDX transition of iodine. Uh, uh, my group and others, we've added non-resonant background effects. 
and it's been validated. I, we've even, it's smart to go into valid, look at the lines you're gonna look at, make sure they're accurate. And at least where the ones that overlap with the YAG laser, uh, it's really good uh, reproduction. So the iodine spectrum model is really good. For mercury, uh, there are a few models uh, out there. Uh, these models are not widespread and I don't think they've had the same type of validation. However, mercury has simpler spectroscopy in general. Okay, our kinetic regime, this is when we, when we say the kinetic regime, this is kind of this Y parameter between 0.3 and 3. Uh, neither, we've already talked about neither Gaussian nor Seta Lorentzian functions are, are good enough. Uh, if we wanted to do this sort of from uh, first principles, we, could, we would have to uh, do a solution of the Boltzmann equation. Again, uh, information we just don't know, collisional cross-section between molecules. So what you do is kind of uh, use, uh, there, there are models that were developed again in the 70s and 80s, uh, which are what are called a class of sort of kinetic models. Um, again, I don't want to go into the modeling. If anyone has any questions, if they get into using these type, feel free to contact me. But the ones that are most widely used are these Tenti S6 and it. 7. Tenti is the person who did it. Last name Tenti and S6 stands for six moment, seven moment models. Okay. And again, they, they use a linearized Boltzmann and some uh, other approximations. But in order to calculate the spectra, you have to know temperature dependent transport coefficients, dynamic and bulk viscosity, shear viscosity, sorry, the dynamic viscosity and the bulk viscosity, thermal conductivity, and the internal speed uh, specific heat capacity. So you have to know all these uh, for the models and if you, you should know the, their temperature dependence as well, okay? Again, for combustion relevant species, that's sparse. Now, near room temperature, it turns out that there's a lot of work done on validating a few of these models based on measurements in the LIDAR community. So a lot of people for atmospheric sensing and stuff, they use these shapes to get out uh, information, uh, such as temperature density. Uh, and so what there, and what, so there's been a tremendous amount of effort in things like N2O2, CO2, and air, really constituents of air, right, uh, to see if these models are right. And in general, you find that there's really good agreement between this quote unquote Tenti model. These are actually, the black are actual spectral measurements of the RBS profile and the red is the model. So there's really good agreement between measurements and the S6 model at lower temperature and pressures. But again, for combustion specific species, uh, fuels, products, intermediates, there's just not nearly the same type of data. So maybe I'll skip this in terms of time. Uh, we did a series of measurements uh, looking at uh, different uh, signals, uh, FRS signals, and a whole host of uh, these combustion relevant species over temperature, uh, compared model to experiment, made measurements in flames, and we found that in general we could find really good agreement between the experiments and models. So if this were a talk just on the Tenti model, I, I would spend more time on this. But bottom line is this. Tenti S6 model, if you end up making a note and you go looking up, you download or use it for measurement, it's pretty good over the re, uh, regime of conditions uh, for combustion. Okay. All right, so let, let's, let's talk a little bit about the limitations. FRS seems to have, the way I'm describing it, has a lot of potential for measurements in more complex environments. Um, but really, kind of beyond demonstration, why has FRS not been widely implemented? So the major limitation in FRS has been the ability to properly suppress. Remember, I called this a, a great PowerPoint diagnostic where I say, okay, anything at the laser line is completely suppressed by the, the filter cell and you collect this light. Well, uh, that's not exactly what happens. It it's, turns out it's very difficult to properly suppress all of the interference that portions of it can just come on through your cell. And here's the reason why. If you take and look at an uh, calculate uh, an iodine spectrum. Just do the model, the Tenti model, and you put in something that's reasonable that we tend to use, let's say a uh, 10-inch cell, it could be a 5-inch cell, but let's say it's a 10-inch cell with about a tor of iodine in it. When you run the calculations, you will see that the blocking is like 15 orders, right? So that would tell me I can block signal up to 15 orders. I can probably block some pretty good particles scattering with 15 orders of magnitude. Okay. Okay. 
now let's think about actually what's happening with a laser a little bit. When we have one of these narrow line width lasers, this is what we call the output, okay? We say it's single frequency, which by means it's this narrow band, bandwidth. But what happens is because these, these cavities are essentially, uh, they're not, again, they're injection seated, they're not injection locked, and I, I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time on that. But what they do is they end up with a broad bound pedestal, okay? Uh, that comes from mode competition within the laser cavity. The cavity can support lots of little modes. This one dominates, but all these other little modes uh, survive, and you end up with this low-level broadband pedestal that may be several order to 10, 15 orders of magnitude lower than this. Well, you say, okay, that probably won't do a whole lot. But if you look at, you can integrate over spectral space, you know, if you uh, have this little frequency at, you know, 0.003 wave numbers, but the rest of this covers about a wave number, its contribution can add up. So when you send a laser like this and it scatters off of uh, particles, right, the portion that's at this spectra, that light will come back and be properly absorbed. But anything that's out that's being blocked by all of this broadband pedestal does not fall within the iodine absorption spectra, right? And so all of that, although it's this little tiny contribution, it adds up, okay? And so your net effect is this is sort of what your effective blocking capabilities become, okay? And I've measured these, and they actually do exactly that. They, you, you're all happy, and then you stop at about at five orders. So instead of having sort of 15 orders of magnitude of blocking due to these broadband pedestals that exist on pulsed lasers, you end up with an, a limitation in your blocking capability, okay? And so those are measurements where we show that this, this is what's happening. So I just want to point that out, that you're now left with only maybe four to five orders if, if you have a really good experiment, okay? And then again, we've already talked about where particles, if they're big, they may be three, four, five orders themselves, higher than the Rayleigh scattering. We're, we're knocking down our filter Rayleigh scattering by a factor of four due to the filter. So now they're starting to become comparable, and if your particles get large, they can start to significantly overwhelm uh, your, uh, your, even your RBS. And uh, same thing for surface scattering, just depends on the characteristics. All right, so as we finish this up, let's look at some of the applications uh, of FRS. One application is in sooting flames. This was actually one of the first applications of FRS in flames by Alfred Leifertz and co-workers. Uh, here's a couple of the references, and this was a sooting premix flame. I believe what we have up here is uh, we have Rayleigh scattering here with no filtering. And what you have is sort of what you would expect. This is a non pre I believe. Uh, it's a flaming co-flow, so you would get high signal. These are, this is kind of old, not, not great uh, quality. But you have high signal, and then you would go to low signal. But then you have these soot structures, right? They're just, you're getting overwhelmed by the scattering from the particulate. Okay? Now, on the bottom, you can actually... Uh, look at a much cleaner signal. This is FRS, and you can, um, I think maybe he's already, oh, he's already inverted this to, to uh, yeah, these are already inverted into, these are just in signal space, sorry. And so you have this high signal, low signal, lower signal, higher in the middle, low, dude, these are the gas products, and then back, uh, back high again, okay? Uh, low temperature, high temperature, lower, okay, so what you would expect. Your signal is no longer being dominated by these sort of soot structures. It's, so this shows kind of what's coming from here. You get this soot scattering. So they're dominating, so you can't recover the temperature. But with FRS, you can get a reasonable estimate of, of the temperature. Okay. Uh, later on, measurements performed at 254 uh, show uh, kind of nice again. Uh, not the best image quality because these are measurements done with an ICCD. I'll show you some recent measurements we're done, we've done that. If you really work hard with your optical setup and use a CCD, uh, keep these in your mind uh, for uh, what kind of the difference between ICCD type measurements and CCD measurements can be. And also, we, we've got a decade to play with. But this is a uh, uh, sooting flame where once the FRS has been applied, you take a profile, and you can get a reasonable, even though it's subject to a lot of uncertainty, a lot of noise here, uh, but you can get, uh, this is in the presence of soot particles. Okay. Let's look at near surfaces. So 
Uh, surface scattering also, uh, as you can imagine, there's no way you can make a Rayleigh scattering measurement anywhere near a surface. But these are critical for heat transfer type studies. So here's a measurement uh, from 2006 that applied uh, Rayleigh scattering uh, near a surface. Okay? And what you can do is see a measurement that gets this clean gas phase measurement right up until to the surface. So again, uh, there's filter Rayleigh scattering thermographic phosphorus. So if you're interested in an application, kind of a near surface, kind of a boundary layer type measurement, you have this, this reference. Okay? Measurements were performed with 250 microns of the surface. Again, here's measurements performed near su substrate. But what I want to move on quickly is uh, mainly uh, let's move on and look at the applications with PIV. Okay? This is where we're kind of from a turbulent combustion point of view where you can really find the utility and the strength in this diagnostic. So again, we've talked about with Rayleigh scattering, you would not be able to put in uh, particles. Uh, but here, this is uh, uh, simultaneous measurement. This is the first demonstration of FRS and PIV, again, by uh, uh, Leipertz. Uh, again, this is flow velocity and, and gas temperature measurements. In a premixed flame, it's stabilized by a rod. There's a, a cylindrical rod, and the flame is stabilized. Now, there's a, there's a lot, uh, again, in, in kind of the quality because of what happens is a good portion of the particle scattering signal can still come in, and then you have to do a lot of filtering to get rid of them, and it ends up just lowering your resolution. But still, this was a great demonstration that you could make velocity and temperature measurements at the exact same time, and it allowed uh, for determinations of, uh, again, heat flux, scalar fluxes, correlation between temperature and velocity. So you could actually get terms that are, if you know a lot, anything about, say, turbulent, or as you get to learn about turbulent combustion modeling, there's unclosed terms in the equations that are their statistical quantities, flux terms that would be the mean of, say, U prime, T prime, okay? And these are very important quantities to measure. And again, this allows access to that. So these are kind of, if you look at these, so this is kind of where FRS PIV has been, okay? This uh, recent measurements from our group, so uh, I think uh, this is actually this year, we've now applied PIV and FRS uh, in measurement uh, in turbulent premixed flames. Uh, this is the fluctuations, the temperatures aren't this, so this is actually a fluctuation from the mean. But what you can see now here, we're getting some, I, I think, some pretty high quality data in the temperature field, and you can actually look at this interaction now between the flame fronts, if you are, at least the thermal field, I should say, and you can see the temperature field and the velocity here that's responsible for curling up this feature. Okay. So again, the difference between, say, this and other is optical collection. Uh, we use CCD. We also have done a lot of work over the years on uh, improving the laser and the light sources by filtering and removing as much of that broadband component as we can. So there, there's a lot, lot that goes into these type of measurements. I just had a PhD student who finished uh, and this is a, I mean, it was a, quite an effort to, to get some of this effort. Uh, we, so uh, hopefully uh, we'll continue to push this diagnostic forward. Okay. And non premix flames are even more difficult. Okay. Uh, now you can imagine there's this large change in species uh, that occur throughout the domain. So the, the one, the, the previous uh, demonstration of this uh, was by Sean Carney, who's at Sandia. And what they did is they did temperature imaging on non premixed flame by uh, filter Rayleigh and Raman. You, they, you need some information in the non premixed flame on how the species, because you can imagine as you cut through, you're going from pure fuel through products to air, right? So the species are changing uh, quite dramatically as you go through. So they did a measurement with. Uh, uh, with Raman scattering to be able to image the fuel mole fraction, and then with some state relationships, some laminar flame type relationships, kind of made some estimates of what the species would have had to, had to be. And here's some comparisons they got from FRS, uh, is kind of the point type measurements, and then comparing it to CARS uh, measurements. And we were going to assume that the CARS are, are accurate, uh, and you can see they're, they're reasonable uh, qualitative agreement, uh, clearly a shift uh, 
uh, in the profile, and it's not just an offset because it changes throughout. So there's, there's some uncertainty in, in the measurements, but it was a, a reasonable demonstration. Uh, so we've taken a different approach. We basically fuel Taylor. If you remember back in the Rayleigh scattering uh, measurement, I said that the most common way to get rid of the species is to mix a fuel blend. There was a methane, hydrogen, nitrogen, such that it has constant Rayleigh scattering. Well, I don't have all the equations, but we, we've done this similar in FRS to where we have the FRS parameter that actually doesn't vary, which is m much more difficult than just not getting the uh, uh, cross-section to, to stay constant. But when you do this, we can get pretty uh, nice measurements, and we end up combining them uh, with PIV as well, and so we can actually measure the temperature field and velocity in non-premix flames and actually also start to derive these, these flux quantities. So again, filter Rayleigh scattering is opening up some good uh, opportunities to look at joint thermal kinematic interactions. Now the final place that I'll have us look, just two slides and then we're done with this lecture, is that FRS has the potential actually to multi-phase flows. The really the big problem, again, it's kind of the same environment, right? Multi-phase, you have a spray, and let's assume the droplets are small enough so that we can block them. You have a gas phase with a particulate background, right? Uh, and, but the real challenge comes in developing models for these complex fuels, polyatomic species. So there was a, a kind of a conference paper. There was an effort uh, at atmosphere and iso-octane uh, from uh, Marcus Aldean's group uh, to, to look at this for looking at fuel air ratio imaging in an actual engine. And so this is a diesel em engine that I believe had uh, heptane, uh, sorry, no, sorry, iso-octane, uh, um, and uh, I'm thrown off by the diesel engine. And so to look at the fuel, because there's a very large cross-section, made some certain assumptions about the model and at least could kind of prove that, okay, maybe there's some opportunity for doing this in an enclosed flow. Uh, we, we've also have looked at this in sprays, uh, very simple experiments, uh, where we've actually developed some of the theory and the modeling behind these higher hydrocarbons. And again, here's just kind of an example. This is, an, uh, this is like low-hanging fruit. This is isothermal spray, right? This is a, a pentane, I believe, uh, three, at one atmosphere, 300K. So it's certainly not an engine. But what we wanted to say, okay, that if we inject liquid phase pentane and it'll evaporate, right, uh, just due to the vapor pressure, uh, these are kind of the droplet fields. These are simultaneous measurements. And then we successfully block all of the particle scattering. This is, we did two camera experiment. You can say we look at the me scattering, or the particle, the droplet scattering, and then this is the gas phase field that's embedded behind it, okay? So we're able to successfully drop, uh, select out between uh, dispersed phase and gas phase. Okay, so that's enough kind of on, on that. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them on filtered Rayleigh scattering. Yes? Those are fluctuations. Those are fluctuations from the mean. Oh, so the mean te temperature in there would have been, say, 1,400 Kelvin. Other questions? If not, we'll take a break. We'll meet back at 320. <laughs>